I got six a few years ago in the Enduro, like the Pro Men's Nationals. Yes. You got six in Enduro? Yeah. And I was stoked on it. And then I came across the finish line. The announcer calls my name is Enos. Dan Enos. I was so mad. (laughs) (laughs) We're about to fight. I just beat Mitch Ruffalato in Enduro Race. We're about to fight. Oh my gosh! Or would you would you consider yourself and Mitch kind of equivalents? Because doesn't no. he do a lot of product no, testing? He's so much higher than me as uh, a racer. Well, I meant he's... more like in your like what you do in your career. No, he gets paid. He gets paid to ride. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Things I don't know. Yeah, yeah. He gets he gets a paycheck. Fun. Yeah. Welcome to the Mountain Bike Movement Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Davidson, where it's my job to deconstruct the techniques, habits, and strategies of world-class mountain bikers so that you can discover how to shred with absolute confidence. We'll cover everything from breaking down exactly how you can ride faster with more control to reducing crashes and even how to transform your life with insights from the leaders of our sport. Whether you're a beginner getting started, an advanced rider hungry for an edge, or an elite rider competing to prolong your career, the Mountain Bike Movement Podcast has something for you. So get ready, let's drop in and go hit the trails. Well, cool. So I'm here with Dan Ennis. That's right. From Brevard, North Carolina. Yep. Yes. Yep. And uh, so, years. so we're like neighbors and we're going to dive in and talk a little bit about uh, what it's like to win national championship at the age of 30 plus 10. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, so for those of you that don't know Dan, Dan is the 2023 USA Cycling Downhill National Masters champ which is the equivalent of extremely good at mountain biking. And uh, he's also been winning races for quite a while. And in school, uh, you went to Brevard. Went to Brevard College. Yeah, won some championships there as well. So uh, the reason why you should probably listen to Dan is because he's just like all of us, you know, he's he's done a lot of different cool jobs. He is a great mountain biker who gets a lot of joy out of riding. And I think this is probably, you're probably what most people genuinely would be satisfied with like very satisfied with if they got to ride like you do and so we're going to talk a little bit about you and some things that you do to essentially get the most out of of riding and having the most joy plus we can talk about whatever in the world you want so we're going to be starting today from the back of my jeep here in the garage so for those of you that don't know this is my house my garage and uh, let's go ahead and dive in so tell us a little bit about um, who Dan Ennis is today Today, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, like David said, I uh, I just leveled up, you know, the big birthday. So heading, <laughs> Happy heading birthday. straight for the grave. <laughs> straight. My my, I, we were joking earlier. It's like my kids can dig pretty good. Yeah, and they were really yeah, confused yeah. when you said that. They're like, "What do you mean?" <laughs> yeah, you know, just go in the backyard and start digging a hole because just roll me in there any moment. No, it's pretty funny. No, I'm joking, man. It's uh, life's as good as it's ever been. Probably at the the highest point it's ever been. So yeah, like David said, I live in Brevard, North Carolina. I moved there for college back in 2007. So it's been a minute. I don't know what math, 16 years, 17 years. Sounds about right. Yeah, about there. So been there for a while. Um, Great spot to ride bikes. Great spot to raise a family, which is what I'm currently doing. Got a two-year-old daughter and a wife that has a pretty heavy career. And so we're just making it happen, just like everyone else, you know, trying yeah. to ride bikes and spend time with the family, and, you know, do it all. Doing it all, man. Yeah. So tell us, um, I, I don't know if you've always been a mountain biker, but what was, uh, in, a, in a maybe a couple sentences or so, what was Dan Ennis, the uh, the middle schooler? If, if we were in middle school together, what would, what would it be like? <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't always been a mountain biker. I did get into cycling in middle school maybe even younger, mm-hmm. but I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, I did too. How far really? Is that? I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> what part? Uh, well, let's see. I was on the southwest side of town on a, a little road called Otters Run Lane. So are you in Orange Park? I think like I was near that. West of the river? I would have to look it up. So I was east of the river in Mandarin. So as you know, not exactly a mountain bike hotspot. Yeah. Wow. We were neighbors as kids. I did yeah. not know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, good. Good yeah, time. so I mean, I, I started with BMX. 
um, just because Florida and mountains don't really exist. And then really quickly, once I started kind of working at a bike shop a little older, 14, 15, those guys were riding mountain bikes and road bikes, and it just kind of went from there. Nice. And uh, got up to some mountains as soon as I could. Got to the mountains. When did you start mountain biking? So I started mountain biking probably 14, 15 years old. Florida has a really good cross-country series. Right. And so all the older guys at the bike shop would go to that, and they started you know, bringing me along. And then my parents are super supportive. My dad was actually a really competitive water skier. Mm -hmm. So when I was born, he was doing the water skiing thing. I mean, like to the level of Ski Nautique was sponsoring him with boats. So nice. that's kind of why we were where we were in Florida. You know, we had, you know, river access, all that. And so once I started to get into a sport, he was like, well, he's going to help pursue his passion. So we started traveling around the circuit in a camper and just doing it all. I mean, nice. from north carolina to miami it was it was on if there was a race we were going and he was supporting it and, that's really uh, cool it was pretty interesting like you talk to him later in life you know back then when you're a kid you think like everything's great hunky dory and he's like man <laughs> nah like that's the bourbon that we towed the camper with i got that thing from a junkyard and i like, <laughs> put the motor in it because he's like we'd roll to races and there'd be 300 dollars in the bank account and it's like we're doing the damn thing but it's like you know, the passion of a father and supporting their, their kids. Now that I have kids, it's super huge to have those conversations. It's mm. like when I get frustrated, it's like, it all works out. But like the things that are important matter, you know, and like keep doing them. Yeah. So, so the, you know, you made a decision on priorities, mm -hmm. got you some cool opportunities. Yeah. And um, did you, when you were younger, did you, kind of know deep down you wanted to do something with bikes did you want to go and be the top pro what kind of what were your desires oh, when you were back then oh well, it took me a while to figure all that stuff out as anyone does sure but the one thing i knew from a pretty young age especially growing up in jacksonville which is like a huge city kind of urban what i saw around me was a lot of folks and i'm generalizing so don't take offense yeah. but would get out of high school or college and then it's like time to get to work and I'd see guys that are like 30, 35 years old and they're kind of like overweight and kind of looking. That's what happens. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> and I was like, man, I don't, I don't ever want to like put my passion behind my like professional life. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And so like I probably could have made a lot more money and been a little farther along on that aspect. But right. I don't know, I've always kind of made the choices of like, I want to live where I want to live so I can do the things I love to do. Mm. But, Good times. So that was like the first one. What was your, was there anything else that kind of made you, I don't know, make the decision to have that standard for yourself of like athleticism or being able to do things you love? Or was it just, man, this is just so important to me. There is no decision. It's, it's like the way it is. Yeah, it's just always kind of been, the way it is for me. Like mm -hmm. I've always been competitive and I've always kind of loved getting out and exploring the outdoors. Yeah. And so for me, it was always like, I'm going to go live in a mountain town and kind of, <laughs> uh Oh, speaking of challenges, <laughs> are we, are we having trouble deciding he kicked you? He hit you? With a spoon? On purpose. On purpose. Well, what are you going to do about it? Runs away and grumbles. I choose the Socratic method of parenting. Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do about it? I don't know. Hey, buddy, be try to get him to be sweet to you. I don't even know if I'm going to cut that part out or not. That's no, funny. It's so perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, anyways, um, <laughs> so yeah, man, you, so you made the decision that writing is important and, um, we're going chronologically here, so might as well. Mm -hmm. When you, I, I do want to ask when you were kind of moving into the collegiate mm -hmm. racing scene, um, did you kind of know that you were competitive right away or when did you find that you were like, Hey, I can actually compete with some of the fastest riders around here. When did, when did that kind of hit you? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been in college. Like when I, I came to Brevard in 2008, I was 20, 
24 or 25, so I was a little older, mm-hmm. for college. Um, and I'd been going to school in Gainesville, and the coach for Brevard College reached out to me to, you know, do the cycling community in the southeast. And they were starting the team and looking for some riders. And uh, he actually asked me if I could be a gravity, like race downhill and slalom. Nice. And I saw an opportunity because he's offering scholarship money. And I never raced a slalom or a downhill race in my life, man. I'm from <laughs> Florida. And I was like, hell yeah, man. I'm your guy. I'm your guy. I'm your guy. So, <laughs> oh my goodness. So I get a job. So I was like, <laughs> I got to, like, I accept. You know, he's like, okay, cool. Season starts in the fall. I was like, all right, I want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so May comes and I get a job at a summer camp in Brevard. Oh, you know, funny. a friend of mine owned a summer camp. He's like, yeah, I got you. You can come tune up the bikes. I'll pay you, you know, 50 cents an hour or some, you know summer camp fee but nice. 50 could, cents an hour i don't know what it was it Rolling. was no money but i had a place to live in brevard <laughs> for the summer and i had time perks you know so i'm like all right cool so i roll up and i figure out really quickly where the brevard college slalom track is i don't yeah. know if you remember that like the one out at the campground yeah really I steep think that I remember it. Built. yeah i'm trying to remember oh that one yeah adventure village it was it had that scary it was kind of wide and it had the big left-handed turn after some drops and a double i think so i think that's the one yeah, yeah. it's like you took one pedal out of the gate and there's like Dang. i don't even think i rode it oh wow well anyways it was so scary i figure out where that track is <laughs> and get out there and i got a little a dirt jump bike yes you know and i was like what was it was it a specialized p2 i think it was a dmr a dmr steel frame yeah nice i think so like the bike shop that i worked for in jacksonville when i got the scholarship i remember telling him like yeah, I'll be racing gravity stuff. And they're like, oh, well, you don't even have a bike. I was like, nah, I'll figure that out. <laughs> that's and, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, and the owner, the owner yeah. um, actually bought me the frame and, like, gifted it to me. Nice. It's like, you know, a going away present. So that was cool. So I go up there, and I find out where the track is. And I got the summer, and I'm like, I can race and start in the fall. i got to figure this shit out. I literally had a little notepad, and I would go online, and whatever <laughs> coaching videos were there, which was almost nothing, when was this again? 2008. 2008. Oh, yeah. Eight. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like the grainiest of grainy YouTube <laughs> videos or like some... 240. Descent 240, magazine yeah. article, you yes. know, on like cornering. And I would just <laughs> hammer that track and then I'd write down what I was doing. You know, when, I, when I, if I'd run into like Chris Herndon or whoever, you know, Joe Haley, some of like the dudes in the area that knew what yeah. they are doing, I'd bust out my little notepad. <laughs> I thought I was a crackhead. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> when I hit this corner... This is happening. And it's like, what is wrong with this person? You know, but like I was determined. I'm going to oh, figure this out. That's so great. Yeah. So you actually had a notepad. I've, I've heard of one other person doing that. Yeah. Um, it was Brandon Seminock apparently has has a little sketching journal or whatever. So obviously, you know, you're the same as Brandon Seminock yeah, first. Totally but, the same. No, that's that's really cool. So um, there's a there's parts of learning where when we learn it's you learn by doing you learn by writing it down and when we write it down it forces our brain to slow down and think about it Mm -hmm. and then you go out and you can listen you can watch all kinds of different ways to learn it's really interesting because you know it speaks to kind of the urgency of the situation yeah were you, were you like afraid of going out and doing a race and just being the worst or? Oh yeah. You know, I, like, I was like, <laughs> I'm going to be a clown out here and this dude's going to know and he's going to pull my scholarship and you know, I'm going to be. Can't homeless. be found out. And yeah. You know, I felt like That's I was so like fun. imposter syndrome to the max, you know, but it worked like, for you. It did. It, it was funny though, being that stressed about it because I was already racing cross country on the pro level. Yeah. You were probably okay. And I was also. <laughs> doing B- like freestyle BMX contests. Oh, wow. And I had a, a sponsorship from S&M Bikes. Okay. So like, it was all there. I just didn't know how to converge it. I think it was in your head a little bit. It was totally you in my head. It. It's, like, <laughs> it's been in my head my whole life, you know, and it's probably yeah. like why things ended up how they are, you know, where you're Interesting. like, you know, there's so no it, option. It turned into curiosity though. hundred percent. That's hundred percent curiosity. And that's like, even now, like what still drives me with riding is, Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's two main things. And one is like the mental health aspect. Okay. And the other one is figuring out a puzzle, which is why, like when I ride, I love to go out with specific goals, you know, training wise or skills development wise, Mm -hmm. or ride in a new section in a different way or, or filming or whatever. Like I love 
setting up a, a puzzle and figuring it out. Mm-hmm. So like those two things are really what drives my riding these days. Nice. And racing works really, really nicely with the puzzle part because it's one of the best puzzles around. Yeah. So. Well, there's always changing conditions. There's fundamentals that kind of well, never change. Yeah, you got to figure it out. You, you got to figure out this game better than your competitors, then you generally do pretty well. Right. So. When And speaking of, you know, the changing nature of the game, I won't get too much into detail. There's usually a couple of patterns that I see based on um, all else equal. If a rider hits, say, 35, we don't heal as fast as we used to. No. When a rider hits 40, mm-hmm. our body doesn't. Sometimes we say go over there and it kind of doesn't. Mm-hmm. And then when we hit 50, the balance starts to, and again, this is if you don't challenge your balance, yes. the balance starts to kind of not work for us. We can't balance. Mm-hmm. And so um, have you noticed that you've had to make any adjustments? Absolutely. And in what way? So it's good that you brought that up because, yeah, all that stuff physically, the breakdown is mm-hmm. scientifically proven. That happens yes. as a racer. I think there's always two sides to every story and being an athlete in your later 30s 40s 50s has those negatives those those battles you're fighting you know balance reflex you know recovery but on the flip side of that as an older athlete you've got some advantages and the main one to me is mental strength and the ability you've been through more in life right most likely you know we've all it's the reason why you know most folks find the pinnacle of their careers in their 50s financially mm. and, and earning income wise everything like that stress level is lowest it's because you've gone through all the, the battles the trials and tribulations yeah and athletically i feel like it's the same way like me now at 40 years old approaching a race my mental game is light years above me at 25 hmm. so even now like this summer i did trans bc which is a six-day blind enduro race in british columbia it's widely known as the hardest enduro race in the world. I've done it twice. And I entered pro. Could enter 40. But I was like, no, nah, I want to challenge myself. I did this race four years ago, and I entered pro. And I kind of flailed around in 40th place, which was a good result. You know, because I mean, it's the top amateurs in the world are at this event. Right. And I was like, I've got this plan I want to put in place, which I could never have the focus plan to do. Plan for a blind race. 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, but... uh <clears throat> having the mental ability to push through six days of five, 6,000 feet of climbing a day, mm. incredibly difficult race terrain, everything goes with it. Food, sleep, nutrition, like staying on point for that long. Yeah. Interesting. I think like the mental game comes into play and mm-hmm. for athletes, I think that's where you can have an advantage. I mean, look at Greg Menard. He's 41 years old. He's still he's a, top he's a dinosaur. in the world. Yeah. I'm like kidding. by, <laughs> but like by all like, you know, physical and, and measurements he right. shouldn't be doing what he's doing no but he's got the the mental game to where he's like nah man like yeah i can't react fast enough but i'm also running at 15 beats lower a minute because i'm not as stressed as you about what's coming like mm-hmm. i've got this knowledge base yes so so the experience for lack of a better term is just incredibly valuable you'd say i think they i think they offset you know you're you're Physically, yes, you're, you're going to drop a little bit, and there's things you can do to limit that, mm-hmm. which I'm sure we'll talk about. But, like, the mental game elevating, like, I'm as fast a racer now as I was at 25, but in different ways. Gotcha. You know, both ways get you to the finish line. Yeah. And it's just about adapting. Yeah, and that to me, it's, I, like, to me, that's encouraging because we all picture ourselves – at the top of the mountain or the bottom of the mountain at rampage. We all picture ourselves in the finish line. And also, I would say for most people that enjoy riding, we also get the same amount of joy as if we were doing that, yeah. if we hit our own personal goals, which may not actually be that high. Yeah. Like you may, we may kind of fantasize about the, the tip, tip, top of performance. Well, those guys also aren't running a business. They're exactly. not showing up in the operating room or they're not like showing up to shape that concrete today or they're not showing up to do that electrical wiring or whatever yep. and it's just it's encouraging to me because it's like you can be a good husband father or mom and or whatever be, be a good person in life 
and hit those goals and be present and be great at riding mountain bikes. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's the just like the coolest thing. I don't know very many sports where you do them in your 40s and 50s where people are like like other action sports in your 40s mm -hmm. and 50s. Maybe skiing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, skiing, paddling. But most the, statistically it's like yeah. the average mountain biker is 44, 46, has a couple kids, has a job. Mm -hmm. It's like we're we're all adults here. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um which is really cool. So, yeah. I think um, let's kind of pivot a little bit because that's a good. That's we covered that pretty well. Um, would you? What do you actually do? If anything, to do you, like, do you have a, a training plan that you use? Do you have things you figured out that work for you and your body, uh, or do you just go mostly ride your bike to stay in shape? Like, how do you approach the physicality aspect of riding? Yeah. So I do have a training plan. Nice. <laughs> I designed it myself okay. and it looks probably a lot different than training plans that you would see from, you know, a, a specific coach coaching outfit where you've got your workout for the day and, and mm. each day of the week you do this interval, you do this gym workout, you do that. Um, I found those used to work for me when I was younger and had more time. Those don't work anymore yeah. because life comes at you hard, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, okay, on Tuesday, I'm going to go do this interval workout, but Tuesday hits and the little one's sick. So she can't go to daycare Yeah, work blows up in your face, <laughs> you know? So here at Tuesday at three o'clock when you're like starting to look at, okay, at five, I'm going to go do this workout. You're fried mentally. Yes. So that workout actually isn't going to help you. Like mm -hmm. what you need to do is pivot. And so like on a day like that, if I've, if I've still got that time, I'm like, okay, hard work, not the move for me mentally. I'm going to pivot and make today that easy work day. And I'm going to get on the e-bike and go do an hour. Nice. And so you're still going to get your trail time. You're still going to get, you know, a little bit elevated heart rate, but it's more of a recovery thing. Yeah. So I, I put flexibility into my plan. I've got ideas of what I want to do weekly, monthly, you know, six months, a year, I kind of build in to peak mm. for dirt, certain events, but I'll allow flexibility within that, you know, for life. Got it. You know, so you kind of have outcomes you need to achieve and mm -hmm. you go hit them based on what's happening. Yeah. Nothing. And I can, I can measure how things are going. You know, I always record different metrics, power, heart rate, so I can see physically where I'm sitting. And once mm -hmm. you start to really dig into those metrics, you start to see, you know, I'm getting a little tired here. I need to take it mm -hmm. easy or, you know, or, or external factors. Yeah. What kind of heart rate monitor do you like? Um, I've just used the Garmin unit. It's mm -hmm. kind of the, the standard. Is it a, um, yeah, I use these? a strap. I've also got the, um, one or the, the, on your watch and mm -hmm. that works fine. It's not quite as accurate as a strap, yeah. but it will get the job done just fine. Yeah. Cheapest, most like cost effective and accuracy. If those are the ones you want, it's a, it's a, the strap around the chest is the yep. way to go. Totally. Cool. Yeah. And, um, so you, you have your training plan, you got it dialed. Mm hmm um, oh, here's a, here's an interesting question for you. So if you say, for example, life got in the way so hard for such a long time that you were like kind of knocked out of the game physically, like you were out of, out mm -hmm. of practice, out of shape e effectively, yep. what would be the first thing that you would be concerned about if you wanted to go right? Like, what would you lose first? If that makes sense? Yeah. So if your endurance, if we're your, talking like six months, a year. Yeah, like years, you're, you're out. like you're just out, and you want to mm -hmm. get back into the game. So the first thing is you got to build back that foundation. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't start your house with the roof, right? So you you go out and do some intervals. First thing after not being on your bike for six <laughs> months or a year, man, you're smoked. You're laid up on the couch. <laughs> Wife's pissed. You know, yeah. you can't can't yeah. do what you got to do. Take out the trash. Can't. Yeah, Sorry. you're limping, man. <laughs> you're just, it, it's a wreck. It's not going to work. So the first thing you need to do is. Just get on the floor on your yoga mat mm. and start stretching, start activating muscles, getting things woke up. Yep. Like as we age, that off the bike work becomes so critical. It's like for me, I do more off the bike than on the bike. I probably ride four to seven hours a week mm -hmm. and I'm on the yoga mat seven days a week. Seven days a week. Yeah. Wow. So you prioritize just movement flexibility, mobility. Yep. Core strength, like yeah. all those little balance muscles, all over your body, all ones running down your ribs mm -hmm. and, and hips and all that. Not, not, we're not talking bicep curls. I mean, that stuff's important, but yeah, 
just the stability in the motion and making sure that everything's balanced. Yeah. Well, we found, and this is after, this is kind of a non-scientific study, but it could be if we wanted it to be. Um, the thing we found the most is when people have a desk job and you sit more than three hours a day, there's a direct correlation to being able to do a horse stance hold. Mm-hmm. And I, I might put a picture down below of this episode or something. The horse stance hold is one of the few things that if you can't do it, I can virtually guarantee that you can't corner on your mountain bike. Yeah. That's one of the patterns that I've noticed um, with people. So there's there's a handful of things that are, if you can't do them off the bike, you can't do them on the bike, at least the way that you should be doing them. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, it's it's interesting. So you have you ever gotten to a point where maybe you've gotten so out of shape that you had to rebuild back and like... So I... I haven't gotten completely off the bike for more than six months ever. I had a bad okay. leg injury once, and it's about six months before so I was you've back. You stayed on, on top bike. of it pretty good. Yeah, but I have slacked on training okay. for a couple of years. You know, how like did you notice that impacted you? Thirty-three, thirty-four. I didn't do a whole lot. Okay. I mean, I was riding my bike just for fun, but just like life got in the way. You know, mm-hmm. jobs ending, relationships, and all that. You know, things happen. Mm-hmm. So for a few years there, I was kind of not really focusing on racing or anything like that. So I was riding when I wanted, but definitely dropped fitness. When I decided at 35, I was going to, it's like, hey, man, you need to either carry off the pot. You know, you want to do some things racing wise, like it's time to to do it because you're not getting any younger here. Um, I first started coming back and I was just riding the bike. Hmm. No core work, no anything like that. Like I'd done that stuff in college, but it'd been a few years hmm. when I came back. I was like, I'm just going to ride. I just need to get in shape. I need to get able to pedal up a hill and not feel dead again. Yeah. So I was like, I'm gonna do 10 hours a week, you know, <laughs> 10 hours a week. That's what I'm gonna do. I was living in Asheville. Bent Creek is right there. I didn't have any kids. Totally doable. What I found though, at 35 doing 10 hours a week off the couch was that I was smoked <laughs> and I was looking like a hunchback. <laughs> And I get to the races, and I do okay because I was pretty talented. And yeah. In good enough shape to pedal up the hill, but when it came to the part that mattered, the descending, the strength, I didn't have it, man. Like, it wasn't Did you there. feel like you were ever out of I w- – I'm really curious because um, when I talk to an athlete who has never trained or they're, they're training off the bike or their balance, their core strength is poor, mm-hmm. I have a – there's a very, very high incidence of people feeling like they're having to lock a lot of their muscles to stay balanced Mm -hmm. because they're not balanced. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you notice that? Absolutely. I'd get to the bottom of a stage Mm. and I would be smoked. We're talking (laughs) like a two minute stage snowshoe, like something that if you're on your game, you should be able Mm -hmm. to just rip this thing and hit it with intensity the whole time. Be like, all right, catch my breath at the bottom for 10 seconds. Good to go. Roll on to the next thing. And it would just absolutely annihilate me. Mm. I think that that's, you, you tell me what you think. But I think that's the biggest confidence booster mm-hmm. is shortcutting the, like just skip over the whole mindset thing and just be confident in your movement and your body. Because yep. if you just bomb down something and your body did what you wanted it to and you're not even feeling tired, that just feels like power, man. Like how cool is that? Mm-hmm. So I would, I would pick that any day over like a mental confidence. I'd rather have a, like a physical expression of confidence that I can Mm -hmm. do Mm -hmm. rather than having to tell myself I'm good at mountain biking. Yeah. So I don't know. What what do you think? I think you're right there. And I think one goes hand in hand with the other. Good point. You know, you start to hit things and you're hitting your lines and you're moving the way you want to. That starts to build and the confidence builds from that. Yes. Yeah. And so, and this is interesting too, because Dan and I rode together uh, a couple, four, five, six weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And the biggest difference I noticed between my, my ability to have speed and Dan's was when the trail got into, uh, there were these berms that were just rutted out and they had rocks and roots and they're mod- I mean, they were three out of 10 dangerous and rough. You can, it's fine. Hi. Uh, and I just noticed that. I would either get a little timid, a little off balance, or just kind of grab break a little bit. And that little bit of grabbing break, that's where you would, you would go 20 feet in front of me in a second. Mm -hmm. And it made a huge difference. So the, uh, the number one way for me to close the gap to catch up to you would be having more of that 
like just body confidence in yep. some of the fast, fast, fast corners. Mm-hmm. And which I don't know, like when you when you go and say, hey, this is what an elite level racer is able to pull off versus like a you know someone who's not quite there. Would you say that it's cornering? Would you say that it's just general body position? Like, what have you noticed? It's a mixture of all of it, but mainly it's that um, the ability to stay fluid. Okay. And hmm. it might seem like they're opposite, but being physically strong and being able to tense up actually allows you to be more fluid. Because, like, coming into those corners like you're talking mm. about, as soon as you start to tense, everything starts sliding. You know, whereas if you stay loose and fluid on the bike, things are allowed to float and grip and your bike will maybe move a little bit, but mm-hmm. it'll continue to grip. And that comes from that ability strength wise to sustain yep. those movements, those little micro movements and balance shifts and all that. Mm-hmm. If your body's working in alignment, yeah, it, that comes naturally. You know? Have you ever worked with someone who like, analyzed your movement off the bike? Mm-hmm. Okay. What did they look at and what did you discover by working with them? It's been a few years, but I was on this program with Yeti Bikes and their their coach, D. Tidwell, had a really kind of cool training plan. I didn't end up doing a whole lot with it, but he had a whole bunch of exercises to see what your movement looked like. Nice. Where he'd film you and then yeah. let you know what I've was. heard of D. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. you have. Good times. And, uh, you know, that stuff really brought up some things that I didn't even know about, like from mm-hmm. previous injuries or just you know, yeah. sides, things I was favoring. And, and yeah. I, uh, I got analyzed by someone called David Thunder mm-hmm. and, uh, you can't, you can't work with him unless you're in the UK. He only works with people personally, like in person now. And, um, he just had me walk and he, it was hilarious. He said, when did you injure your left ankle? And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I didn't <laughs> tell him this stuff. Yeah. And I said, uh, I mean, college, I was trying three sixties and bailed and he's like when did you break your left collarbone and i'm like high school he's like and what happened with your right collarbone and he literally went through just from watching me walk and did an injury inventory on me and and what it taught me was that there's a correlation between how the body moves in injury Mm -hmm. and the inefficiency of or maybe imbalances in your body and just kind of net result of how you move through space Totally. And it got me really thinking. I was like, oh my gosh, this stuff is important. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's kind of, um, it's a whole world out there where not a whole lot of people talk about it, but it seems like all of the top riders have been through something. To... They've been through something and all the top guys are spending, I guarantee more time in the gym than on their bike. Yeah. Yeah. That was the thing that surprised me the most. Um, Cause I didn't start riding until I was 20 and I didn't start. I, I don't think I even got very decent until gosh even maybe three or four years ago when i started doing off the bike work Mm -hmm. and that's when i started feeling that fluidity yeah um when i when i first started it was just it was it was pretty bad like i did all the things wrong i'm pretty sure and still managed to do all the cool stuff on the bike (laughs) yeah yeah so the movement off the bike definitely important Mm -hmm. yeah well tell us uh what are what are your plans for 2020 what we're almost 2024 right 2024 yeah Yeah. any plans for 2024 if you want to we can talk a little bit about you know you've you've done some testing yeah um you've done some you've done quite a bit of not just wrenching on bikes but um you know high level kind of testing parts out testing out systems for companies and Mm -hmm. giving them feedback so if you want to talk about that a little bit we can sure yeah so i right now i help Trek bicycle company with um, like testing for their engineering team. Um, everything from proof of concept stuff where it's like an engineer internally or whoever mm-hmm. has an idea of maybe this could be a cool change or a cool idea. Let's weld something up or let's, you know, cobble something together and, and yeah. get some feedback on it. So. I'll, I'll do some of that stuff all the way up to uh, a product that's finished and out in the market. You know, like Fuel EX is a good example. That bike's mm-hmm. been released for almost a year now. It's their mid-travel trail bike, kind of the bread and butter rig. And I've still got one in the garage that we're playing with different things on it. You know, it's like, oh, what if we gave it a bit more travel? What if we gave it a bit less travel? What if we turn it into a slalom bike? Mm. What about these tires on it? What about this, you know, 
There's always yeah. continuing development. It's even down to like tiny things of like, what if we made the chain slap protection a softer rubber? <laughs> but like everything needs to be sorted out. The things out. that matter. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like people think like, oh, product testing, you're up on, at um, Champeray and you're like ripping laps and doing suspension tuning. It's like, or I'm riding around in my driveway with a microphone <laughs> taped to my chain stay, bouncing up and down so a chain can hit a piece of rubber and see That's what sound funny. it makes. Like, hey guys, I got the upload. <laughs> yeah, seriously. It's like, it like kids in the background. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's pretty awesome. Cool. Yeah, that job's super fun. Um, that, that is actually, we should start a company where you childproof the bikes and we can we can test. Can't be done. It can't, actually, you're right. That would be a terrible idea. <laughs> Let's not do done. it. It can't be done. <laughs> Childproofing anything can't can be done. Call my daughter, little baby danger. Little she's baby like, danger. If it's dangerous, she's into it. Oh, fun. Yeah. Well, good. So, yeah, you, you, um, you've done quite a bit with... With testing, how long have you done that? Have you been doing that for? I guess with Trek, it's been three years. Three years. Mm -hmm. okay. Before that, I worked in product development with King Creek. Right. So I was engineering tech with them. And then previous to that, it was Olean's. Yes. Kind of keeps going back and back and back. Owned a suspension service center somewhere along the line. And oh my gosh. Yeah. So I've been working in that realm for a long time. I really enjoy that stuff. Yeah. How did you, do you, do you just have to be, exceptionally good enough for them to notice hey and then also you have to be good at understanding what's actually going on I, and communicate it is that basically communication the yeah okay. that's that's like the biggest part like there's a ton of guys that are faster at riding bikes than me mm -hmm. I mean, cold hard fact not the fastest dude figure that out really early in my career actually like i'm not the fastest guy okay I'm pretty fast not the fastest but what i figured out that those guys didn't is relationships matter and carrying yourself professionally in any situation, especially when you're in a bike situation, yeah, matters a ton. And so mm -hmm. I figured out how to meet the folks that make decisions in the bike companies and, and help offer, them out. hey man, like I would love to ride your shock and give you feedback and then actually give useful feedback. Not try to bullshit. You know, if I'm not yeah. an engineer, which I don't have an engineering degree, I don't need to give you engineering level feedback you're going to be like this he doesn't know what he's talking about yeah the shock squirmed when i went into this 20 foot jump i was pulling massive g's yeah like trying to tell thing. them how the valving needs to change it's like no man yeah. you're not looking at yeah. the the files you're not <laughs> doing that analysis but what i can tell you yeah it's real world more feedback. real world feedback like that's cool you know hey this tire seems to cut really easily in this situation then they can take that feedback mm. and Translated. offer something else then i okay i went back and replicated the situation we're doing better now that you changed whatever to the sidewall but yeah. now it's a little harsh in this other situation and it, it fast forwards as a team effort the product development yeah and that brings up another point which is the quality of bikes is insane i know some people mm -hmm. they maybe complain a little bit about the price of mountain bikes and i kind of disagree because I think that the amount of access to the highest level of quality yeah. is right there. So a lot of people will say, oh, well, it doesn't have a motor. You can get a dirt bike for five or 10 grand. Well, yeah, you can. The tolerances on that dirt bike probably aren't quite as good mm -hmm. as the tolerances and the precision and the amount of quality that's gone into the mountain bike. And what I think people maybe don't realize is that they're actually getting a very close to hyper competitive level machine yeah for actually a lot less money that's my opinion so one thing to think about look at look at world cup downhill racing yes and that's the pinnacle of technology in the sport i right. would argue yes nine of the ten bikes on a world cup podium you can go and buy yeah and ride you, you can't. really can't you can yeah. actually like, buy them off the can, shelf right I, yeah yeah like you can go buy it like Looking over here, I'm looking at a common saw with full Olin's A kit suspension. Yeah. And you just ordered that bike online and it showed I, up at your house. I got that one straight from I just clicked a button. Yeah. It was actually like, a really good experience. You can't click a button and get an F one car delivered. No. Or a supercross tuned motocross bike. No. Or any like you know, so like we're in a really cool space. Yeah. On that note, you know, I think there's a pretty wide discrepancy between quality and companies within the bike industry. Okay. So break that, break that down for me. What so do you think? What we see, and I'm coming not just because I work with Trek now, but I've also worked with little guys and I've worked with 
bunch of companies and the amount that companies put into the development of a product has a pretty uh it's pretty wide you know from like we're gonna order a catalog frame from taiwan or we're gonna run it we're gonna put our stickers on and send it out there to we've got a group of testers and engineers across the world and we're collaboratively you know we're running this yeah. product in all sorts it's of like scenarios science. it's like a science yeah. mastermind so like, <laughs> i mean i hate to say it but it's hard to beat the big boys when it comes to having a product that's super well made and designed mm-hmm. and has the support so yeah my my guess is is that just because they have the resources resources 100% yeah yeah, yeah. i've had uh, very good experiences with specialized bikes mm-hmm. um, i really like my common saw yeah and they're not as small as you think they're a huge no, they're company i worked directly with them with yeah. king creek and we would go to california when they spec king creek stuff mm-hmm. and have test trips and they'd fly in four engineers from andorra yeah you know, that's yeah. not cheap oh and another thing here's a cool fact so i have probably i've probably had 10 or 12 king creek headsets mm-hmm. and i've never had a problem with a headset from them i've had issue i'm not going to name names i've had issues with cracking headsets i've actually blown a headset out just hmm. pff, exploded it it wasn't a cane creek yeah i've never had an issue with the cane creek in my life Nah, you probably won't exactly it's a solid product it's a solid product been around for a long time and has a really yeah. good support structure around yeah. it yeah i like them there and they're right up the road i've actually met some of the folks that work there and oh yeah it's good i time, mean so i worked there for three years Still had a bunch of great friends that work there. It's a good yeah. company. Great company. So, and and they probably come spec on your bike if you're listening. So you don't even have to do anything. Nope. No action step. Just go ride your bike. <laughs> so we talked about, we talked a little bit about your story. We talked about racing. We talked about movement work, mm-hmm. training. We've talked about, gosh, uh, testing, production, a little bit of what's up next for you. Or do you have any specific goals or plans for 2024 or anything i don't know um i haven't really made any plans yet for 2024 as far as bikes go okay um i've got some ideas <laughs> but, ideas uh nice yeah, yeah i don't know the downhill the the national champ thing this year was pretty cool i was kind of off not off the couch. Were, were you expecting to win or were you expecting to be competitive there or what was your kind of... I didn't know what to expect. I hadn't raced a downhill bike in six years. I hadn't owned one in 10. That's funny. Um, I borrowed a downhill bike from one of the internal guys at Trek. Uh, he sent it over and I rode it the weekend before the race and then I rode it yeah. at the race and then I packed it up and sent it back with a national championship uh, <laughs> plate on it. <laughs> so here you go. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate it. Um, Shout out to John. Yeah. So, I mean... <laughs> It was kind of eye-opening. My time was probably the fastest of the amateurs. Uh, I think I might be the, wrong on what that. What was the split between you and Luca? Uh, Luca got me by a good bit. It was like 25 seconds. 25? Okay. Yeah. Um, he's a pro. Yeah. He was probably he was probably running pretty hot, too. Like, he wasn't trying okay. to hold back. No, he wasn't holding back. I. Yeah, I mean, he would have got me. I think... It's interesting when you're racing age group versus pro, like the mindset difference. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, I kind of, once I got up there, started to see the competition. I was like, mm, okay, I think I might have this. Might turn it up a little bit. I'd had bit. a crash the day before. Yeah. And so. You I mean, broke your chain in the start gate, too. Broke right? my chain in the start gate. Yeah. And then, okay. yeah, I had a crash and hit my head pretty good. Got oh, cleared wow. for compression, concussion protocol. Are but, you sure? Uh, <laughs> I, I did not. I, I had a concussion. That is a hundred percent. The two weeks after, definitely let me know oh that gosh. like, okay. I hope you're good. I'm good now, but okay. like, I think there were 15 seconds on the table, easily. Interesting. Yeah. So, so that's a question I have for you. When you retroactive, so looking back on race runs, not talking about when you're in the start gate and you've got the adrenaline or whatever popping mm-hmm. through you. But when you're looking back and you kind of analyze most of your previous runs, mm-hmm. when you're at your best result, what percentage would you say you're giving it? Is it 85? Is it 95? Is it 99? Is it a hundred? Like where are we talking about like downhill races? Yeah. Like kind of letting loose and well, well, you can talk about both separately if they're yeah. different, but like how much are you really riding on your edge of your ability? 
in a downhill in race, like percentage wise, yeah, uh, ninety five to one hundred percent, ninety five to your ability because wow. you know the track, you've been practicing on the track for two days, mm -hmm. you know every root and rock, and for me, that was actually something I had to relearn really quickly at national champs. Oh wow, because I've been racing enduro, enduro you might get a practice on eight on the stage, hmm. and it's a five to ten minute stage, and there's five of those. Yeah, so when I go yeah. to EWS in Whistler, I've got one run on each stage two days before, and then we go race it. So it's basically blind. Mm. So you're painting with a really big paintbrush yeah. when you're going down the stage, which means you can't attack at 100% because you're going to get offline. You're going to mess up a corner. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of a keep it to the fundamentals and get through the stage clean. Like keep it moving forward, but like you're not necessarily like pumping every you know, transition and, and you're leaving right. time out there, but so is everyone else. So it all comes out in the wash. So the strategy is more about with enduro, you would say it's about minimizing mistakes yes. and just staying in the fundamentals and being in that box. Yeah, and totally. Then downhill and is keeping your equipment together, keeping the equipment together too. Yeah. Yeah. Where downhill, you got two and a half to four minutes on one track, mm -hmm. one run. It's like max. Everything has to be maximized because it's a game of like seconds. Yes. You know? Yeah. That's the thing that surprises me the most about downhill is how they're still popping tires. It's like oh. you would you would think that after the cush core or in the or whatever the the tire inserts, tubeless and all that, mm -hmm. that it would at least not be as common. They're just pushing so hard yeah. and it's again, if you can gain three seconds on the track by running twenty two PSI instead of twenty four PSI you're going to roll that dice. Yeah. You know, if you think you're can win, it's like, well, I'll just try to miss the rock and maybe I'll get lucky. Gee. So that's pretty cool. Well, good times. So no particular plans for 2024. Hopefully it includes some more of us riding together pretty soon. So yeah, we'll definitely ride bikes. I'll ride probably bikes. do another blind enduro somewhere. The boys are kicking around the idea of trans Madeira might go back to trans BC. Um, I don't know. Stone King Rally is looking kind of cool. cool. Definitely a, a multi-day blind enduro race. Uh, I'll probably do the Tennessee National because I just love that event. It's in March. It's a good barometer of your like winter training, how it's been going. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. There's this downhill world championship for Masters idea kicking around. I haven't quite come to terms with what that would take because that's in Carnes, australia <laughs> oh wow yeah dry and dusty yeah and a lot of a lot of money a lot yeah. of time if you wanted to just show up for one of those are we talking like five figures investment just to get over there yeah i mean the flights are probably four grand okay so you're you're talking about full family vacation oh, kind of wow. investment minimum yeah. just to yeah that's a big one but yeah i don't know the national champs thing kind of Get you thinking. <laughs> got, got you thinking. Well, good. It sounds like you're a, you got a good trajectory and yeah. uh, looking forward to having a lot of fun, not slowing down a bit. So it's good to hear. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Well, man, I really appreciate it. We've we've gotten a lot of learning lessons from today and really appreciate the detail you've shared and the insight. So that's uh, not something that people get to listen to all the time. And I'm sure it'll be really valuable for the listeners. So thank you all for listening. Uh, again, Dan Ennis. Brevard, North Carolina. If someone wants to link up and maybe catch you on a ride or yeah. follow you around, would it be just wh where's the most common place that you ride? Uh, I'm normally riding from the house, right? Okay. Pisgah Forest. Pisgah Forest. Ride cool. straight into the forest, ride all the Bennett Gap, Black Mountain, all the so, all the gold standards. So if you see a fast guy with a big yeah. smile on a trek, it's Dan. Yeah. Wave at him and don't take a photo. Don't take a photo. <laughs> yeah. It's, <laughs> It's a secret prototype. I'll tell you all about it. Just no photos. No photos. <laughs> cool, man. Well, thanks so much. It's great yeah. having you on the show. Appreciate you. Absolutely. And we'll do it again. Thanks. I'm loving her too. It's great. Isn't it great though? Like they're really, they're so sweet when they're really little like that. Uh, and you never get that back because they get older and they're just like, fart. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday was hilarious. I don't get, get home and I'd gotten a uh, pack of volume boosters for my shop. Oh yeah. It's this product market on. Doesn't matter. I've got just like the bag of like the five of them. They're different colors, different sizes. Uh, and there's laying on the back um, little table on our patio while we're unloading the truck. Like, uh -huh. Get her out from daycare and set her down. She zeroes in on them. 
<laughs> so I was like, Daddy, open. Spotted. I was like, okay, so I cut it open for her, and I'm like, we should play with these things for like 30 seconds, and then it'll be the end of it. She carried them around her hands all fucking these things. All night. Put them in the bath with her. Demanded to be put to bed. <laughs> with the volume <laughs> With the volume reducers. Woke up this morning. First thing, she's like, reducers. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and they've fallen out of her bed. She wanted me to get them so she could cuddle with them. Reducers. She That's... probably still has well, them. They're colorful. Hand. They're colorful. They're different sizes. Yes. How funny is that? Room, house full of children's toys. It's yes. It's like... <laughs> Here, take, take this bike part. <laughs> the volume like, reducers. Yeah, the most random thing, dude. It's like, That's hilarious. And I had to, like, steal the one that I wanted away from her so I could, like, finish my project. <laughs> That's so good. You're into these style of bikes, so you'll be into it. Built a so slalom bike out of a... It's like a trail frame that we were oh, testing. Trying to, like, revalve the shot, reduce stroke on it. Look at that rocker. That's like a little, um, it's like a ticket ass. Can you see my ticket? Yeah. So this is their 140 trail bike. Dude. But I've got it all chopped down to be like a 110 solid bike now. If I get better, which I think I'll probably, probably be okay, but you see the ticket S right there? Yeah. You know how the, the bottom, I don't know what it's called, like the, the bottom part, uh, the chainstay? Mm -hmm. So the, the shock attaches to the chainstay. All the pros, theirs attaches to the frame. Yep. I'm assuming so it ramps up faster, right? Probably, yeah. Dude, how can I get a... Could, could you, like, find some bargain bin parts for me? Oh, man. <laughs> I can try. If you if, okay, okay, if you you if you run across one, then I'll take it. I'll put it that way. And I'll what's, throw you some... I'll what's you some. interesting with <laughs> Trek, in my deal with them, being that I'm in the um, engineering group, as, mm -hmm. like, a product development asset, it's easier for them to send me free stuff than to sell me things. Interesting. So like part of the deal is I'm supposed to get a couple of bikes a year and be able to like purchase a couple of others at like this kind of rate or whatever. Kind of rate. Yeah. And I've never been able to purchase a bike. Because they can they've never figured it out. They're like we don't know how to do this through accounting and all that stuff. And so I was like, send them an email. We don't know how to do this through accounting? Because they're just like the engineering and like development team. Oh, like, yeah, we just have a budget. We just like send it away. That's so good. Yeah, and then when like Rock Creek announced National Champs, I've not down the bike in like seven years. Probably later. No I'm way. Like 10 years. I've not down the bike since I graduated in 2013. You just can't have a downhill bike when you're a, a real adult. Like it's, it's almost, you're just like, well. Just, yeah, it's got into the enduro thing and it yeah. just like fell by the wayside. Enduro bikes got so good, you could just ride them. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, Rock Creek, I was like, oh, I want to support the event. I sent an email. I was like, hey, I see that the cheapest downhill bike is in stock. Can I buy it? And they're like, uh, what if we send you like the head product manager's personal bike instead? And you can just ride it as long as you want. <laughs> it's really hard for you to buy a bike. Yeah. And then send it back. And I'm like, I guess so, sure. And so this bike shows up. And this thing's got like envy wheels. I mean, it's like twelve thousand dollar downhill bike. I it's I like had price. some twenty six in envy wheels laced to Chris King hubs on the, yeah, that's the, the transition was. bank, and it was like I didn't like them at all. Mm -hmm. And I think it was because they had bladed spokes. Yeah, so they had bladed spokes, and the nipples were inside the rim. Didn't like them. I was terrified of them. I didn't like them. <laughs> I was like, these feel like stiff and wobbly yeah. at the same time. Yeah, I wasn't a fan. No, I had no, them. Like, when I raced on the Niner team for the first season, they were sponsored by Envy or Edge at that time. Yeah, they were all under carbon and 29ers. Dude, I stuff. broke so many of those things. It was always a pain in the butt. Yeah, I have a question for you. So, like, so if I were to go and race, like, a downhill circuit, mm -hmm. and I was a pro rider, and I was just, like, not a, you know, I'm not, like, the wheel-breaking expert, mm -hmm. but, like, I just I was a regular guy on the pro circuit. How many sets of wheels do I need? So you're like a privateer? Yeah. So like I'm, let's say I'm racing like the World Cup. Just because we can all see the tracks, right? World like, Cup racing. Do you need like five sets of wheels per race or like? I would say at least two backup rears and one backup front. If you're competing at the top level. That, okay. That's and not unreasonable. No. And That's part like, of that is going to be when you're looking for like the maximum performance. Mm -hmm. A lot of those dudes are running tensioned wheels so they track better 
So they run the spoke tension way down. And you're using like 30% like way bolt. down? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So these things, you can hear them. Like when I was at the Snowshoe World Cup and I'm like listening to the guys come through, you can hear the wheels pinging, you know, like when you hear a low mm -hmm. spoke. And they're just smoking the rims because there's no support. But they don't care. They're like max performance. So those dudes were lacing up rims at Snowshoe every like three months. They're like, they had mechanics at the bottom just throwing new wheels on, and they were just throwing rims away. Like, the pile of rims in the pits was ridiculous. Gotcha. So, like, if you go and do 10 practice runs, you're you're burning through potentially the top guys. Six, seven, eight oh, front and rear wheels on a weekend. Yeah. That's well, the rims aren't too expensive. They're like, yeah. you know, like 100, 200, 300 bucks if you're, yeah. if you're at that level. So, Whatever. so the, the rim actually matters less. It's more about like the tolerance that you're running it at. Mm -hmm. And when you sacrifice performance, you're yeah. going to destroy the wheel. Mm -hmm. That's and down. Cool. It's so different, like between downhill and enduro. Huh. Like when you do EWS races, those guys are probably like, I want all well, the durability as much as possible. Yeah. Right? Because your equipment actually gets stickered at check-in. Mm -hmm. You have to complete the entire race weekend, like all the practice and racing on the same frame, fork and wheels. Sense. Like they're they're stickered up. Mm. So.